Hello, everyone. I am Cody. And I'm Brent. And we are the Hugo Knots. And we are rolling out the red carpet here at Worldcon 2022 for interviews with authors and content creators. Hi, hi. We are on the red carpet here with the team from World Building for Masochists at Worldcon 2022 with Rowena, Marshall, and Cass. Um, tell us and tell our audience a little bit about yourselves, what you do on the podcast. What, well, what we do, well, the podcast is about three deep nerds who love world building so much that we just have to talk about it every two weeks. <laughs> and we, we just go into deep levels of how far you can go into world building without driving yourself crazy and without driving your readers crazy. Yes. That's that's really the key part. <laughs> I mean, we're already crazy. So yes. it's often about the craft element too of, you know, how do you not drive a reader crazy? How do you not um, take someone down with you as far as we have gone? Um, and the amazing thing is that we have found a community of people who also enjoy this so much, um, who listen to us and, and hang out with us on our Discord and things like that. Um, so that's been the real delight of the podcast is we're not the only ones. Well, and you also have very fun. Oh, did you... Did you have a thought? I can always say Sorry. things, yes. yes. I would say the other, I think, big component of the podcast is we get to have on um, other authors as guests. And often they are people who are writing different kinds of fiction than we write. They're, they have different specialties. Um, they work in interesting fields in their other jobs that influence either their world building or, or things that could be useful to our listeners. And that is also so much fun, is that we get to you know trick these people into coming and talking to us and giving us their brains for an hour at a time. And that is also one of the just huge, huge joys of getting to do the podcast. And one of the most fun things about your podcast is your chemistry and, <laughs> and with guests and stuff. So, so, you know, that's what makes, you know, any entertainment or podcast good, right? Is that, is that people enjoy listening to you all be friends. Um, where do you know each other from? Twitter? Twitter. <laughs> Literally the, the origin of the podcast was that Rowena and I and our original third code host, uh, Alex Rowland, were just being fools on Twitter about world building. And somebody, somebody was like, three of you should be on a world building panel. And then somebody else said, you should start a podcast. And we were like, <laughs> should we start okay. a podcast? I'm free Wednesday night. <laughs> yeah. How about you? <laughs> and then when Alex left, we were like, we need somebody cool to be a new third person. For some reason, and they <laughs> decided I was yes. cool. I, I, <laughs> we had had Cass on as a guest already and was delightful. And so therefore we were like, Cass would be really, really good as our, as our new third person. And voila. But yes, you're and right that we do the have chemistry, to... chemistry, I think, ha has Thank been you. magic. <laughs> as a, and you're right, we do have to enjoy one another's company. So that was definitely a part of our decision-making process. And having a yeah. podcast to begin with and to keep going with it was, it's really fun to talk to each other. And yes. we enjoy hanging out every other week and just, can I say bullshit? Being on our bullshit. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes you may. I think we get one. <laughs> so you said two, so we may oh, have to laser one out. Okay. Now we'll figure it out. Um, so why masochists? Why is that included? Why do you feel like that's appropriate? Because I feel like it's just fun. It was an off-the-cuff suggestion, I think, way in the beginning. Because we were joking about, you know, we world build till it hurts. Why do we do this to ourselves? And so when naming the podcast, it was like an off-the-cuff kind of a joke suggestion. We we're like, no, actually, that, that fits that really works. well. Yeah. That works. <laughs> And also, I mean, it was the sort of thing that's like, well, that's kind of striking. That'll at least get people's attention. Right. <laughs> um, were any of you dungeon masters when you were growing up or still currently? When I was growing up. It's been a long time for me. <laughs> um, I, I actually refuse to, to DM or GM in other games because I spend so much of my life being in control of the world that gaming is my one opportunity to, like, not just to be the player, yeah. exactly. It's like, it's relaxed time for me, but I do, I've played games since I was a teenager. Um, I'm currently in a Star Trek themed uh, RPG that we're doing online and it's it's super fun. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of overlap in what you have to consider and, and what you think about in those. Yeah, I feel like it's a gateway for a lot of people. It definitely is, like, definitely oh, is. well, I could just keep writing it and then release this yeah. as fiction. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so. We've got we've got a lot of these. 
um, already without me looking. And so now <laughs> I have to scroll for awkward time. Um, how did your love of science fiction fantasy get started? You can each answer. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't remember not loving stories. I love stories. I love stories and made up worlds. I love stories. Um, <laughs> Sorry, we're all very close. Camera close. Um, so, I mean, the, the earliest books that I loved as a kid were were fantasy stories. And I think very early on decided, I want to make these up too. This is fun. This whole idea of creating a world that you get to go play in yourself. You know, it's fun. I think for a lot of writers, um, you know, it's, it's play first. As kids, we play. And that's how we played as kids. And it's how we keep playing as adults. Um, so that's probably where it started for me was like my geeky, nerdy childhood, reading books and making up worlds to play in. Yeah, same. I, I mean, if I had to think of like an origin point, like I first saw the Star Trek episode City on the Edge of Forever when I was three and it had imprinted on me and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was stuck forever then. Uh, for me, it was The Last Unicorn when I was like three years old. I saw that the movie version um, and I, that's it was it. I was like, oh, I want I want only things like this that have magical creatures and, and magic and weirdness in them. Um, what made me realize that like I actually wanted to do it as a career though was seeing Star Wars when I was 11 for the very first time. And just the size of that universe and how every little corner of it seemed to have its own stories and how I could see myself in those corners. And, and like you said, Rowena, like putting yourself in the story, I was like, oh, I wanna make worlds that are gonna do that for other people. I just rewatched The Last Unicorn because it came to my brain and I was like, oh, I should check. It's so creepy. It is so creepy. And it's like, kind of fun. I like that oh old gosh. creepy animation. It is. It's that, it's that Rankin-Bass style and it's, it's just so eerie, but like, I don't know, it grabbed me as a kid. I was like, yes, this, this is my world. <laughs> totally. Me too. Th those early 80s animations, they, they knew they how to, hard. they went hard and they knew, I mean, you had that, you had... You had Watership Down. Rats of Nim. You had that was, Rats of Nim. Nicodemus was creepy oh, as hell. Yeah. Yes. And they were just like, no, kids can take it. Let's, yeah, let's, yeah. let's, let's mess them up. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> What's the other, the Canadian one? Uh, Little Nemo. The, the one where he has nightmares and he's yeah. in the bed. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I might be too old creepy. for that one. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, there's been a lot of talk. I feel like it's a, a newish thing that's developed between um, hard and soft magic systems in fantasy. And we've always had like hard and soft science fiction. And it feels to us kind of like there's, there's this spectrum crossover between fantasy and science fiction where like a hard magic system overlaps the soft science fiction. Um, where do you all think that, that kind of that genre line is or blends or what are your thoughts? I mean, there, there is a question of just how much a magic system is defined, but like, I don't think there's necessarily a hard rule. I mean, you make your own hard rules, but I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. And I think anyone who tries to sort of impose that sort of sense of right or wrong answer, it's whatever is right or wrong for the world. And there's no, there's no, I mean, that's the great thing about world building is there is no correct answer. There's only what's correct for you in the world you're building. Yeah, and some of it is the world building and some of it is the storytelling itself. You know, how does the author treat the magic system? Um, I think we've mentioned on the podcast and various other places that, you know, if if a magic system is ingrained in a society and is ordinary enough, it feels like just like science, better living through cantrips and alchemy. You know, so I think that there's an element of not only the building of the magic system itself, but then how do you tell that story? Who's telling that story? What elements are you pulling out? What elements are you put, you know, leaving back on? How involved is the character in the magic system? How much do they even understand? So some of it is, is kind of that craft storytelling um, choice that a person can make and that defines whether it's soft, hard, somewhere in between what the heck it is um, as much as the world building itself does. I think a lot of the answer is how much math do you feel like doing? Right. Like how, how gritty do you want to get about about the physics and, and those calculations? I, I'm very bad at math, so I, in either sci-fi or fantasy, tend to lean further away from that. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's a, I don't I don't think it should be taken as a qualitative thing that you know either is inherently better than the other in some way or should be taken more seriously. It's just a flavor. Yeah, I was largely as yeah asking about the distinctions, which I think was uh, what you what you just said well um, and 
Yeah, as long as it's internally consistent, right? right? As yes. long as it yes. makes sense to the reader and the reader's not like, well, what about that, though? <laughs> but some readers like, you know, like the crunchiness. They like, you know, yeah. <laughs> there, there are those who, who like a fantasy book that reads ju with, just like, like an RPG manual, but with a bit of plot. And some people who don't want that at all. And so it's, you know, it's writing to whichever audience best fits your needs. Right. Um, what books were, would you recommend to science fiction fans who are interested in trying out some more fantasy? Um, I just finished The Surviving Sky by Kritika Rao, which is a science fantasy book uh, coming out next year. And it's, it's, it's so weird and I love it. I, I could not stop reading it. It's, it's definitely fantasy based, but it has a science element in how the characters think about what they're doing. So that might be a good sort of crossover point to get you started and, and moving towards the fantasy direction if you're interested in that. That is a really good answer. And now, now um, let's see. I mean, I, this is kind of a gimme easy one, but I'm going to have to go with uh, Fonda Lee's Greenbone Saga, starting with Jade City, because it is, it is a secondary world fantasy, but it is set in more of a modern-ish world. It's sort of like a, it actually like spans from like a 1950s-esque world to a 1980s-esque world over the course of the whole series. So it has all those fantasy elements, but it's still like enough that if you haven't read fantasy yet, you can get your toe in and not have the expectations of what fantasy is supposed to be, which is a big thing we love to talk about, that fantasy does not have to be one very narrow sort of thing. Yeah, I think that that's probably one of the hardest parts of getting someone who hasn't been into fantasy into fantasy, whether it's coming from sci-fi or coming from lit or coming from romance or whatever, is that if they go on Reddit and ask who they should read, who will they be told, everyone? Oh, you, should like you, should you should read Malazan. You should read Malazan. You should read Malazan. Um, and so, you know, the, the, <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. But that, that, that's, that's what they're exposed to is Malazan is Sanderson is, have you read Tolkien yet? And so, you know, that, that can put up some barriers to people. So no matter what you're wanting to get into, whether it's from sci-fi, from other places, kind of saying, okay, what else do you like? Do you like romance? Okay, you should try um, Jasmine Throne or Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri. Do you like, um, you know, big, large-scale, epic, revolution, like historical kind of stuff? Oh, have we got stuff for you on that front? Um, do you like a more modern, like, kind of crime story? Fonda Lee is perfect for you. Try that. So I think there are so many different entrees into fantasy that people just aren't aware of because there's that idea of it is... High fantasy means medieval esque elves setting, and dwarves, elves and dwarves, and swords and sorcery. And it's like, th that's great and that stuff is fun, but that's not all there is to it. Yeah. And that's what we try to do on our podcast about science fiction is talking about there's this massive spectrum. Uh, what subjects are you interested in? What, like, subgenres do you like? What type of uh, format do you like? Like, you talked about crime uh, thrillers. Like, that, they, they all exist in both science fiction and fantasy. And what's, what's your favorite in there? Um, so on your show, you spend each episode like going deep on a single um, element of world mm -hmm. building and like how how to build that out in in your world. Um, for each of you as writers, what's your personal favorite part of a world to go way too deep on? I am a map guy, and I go absurdly deep on maps. I, I mean, I will build maps for worlds where like I don't even know what I'm going to do with it yet. Like I haven't even come up with anything resembling as but I will build a world map first and then start to figure out from there. And with the world for my main series, I like first drew the initial map of that back in 1990. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, every time like I got a new computer and thus had like a new program that could handle more intricacy and depth of like, I'm going to do more layers and more <laughs> and more detail. And so now I have an absurd level of detail on that map of like, you know, where, you know, all around the world, when most of my books take place in one city and all of that detail is not necessary for the sake of the book. But I just, I love, it, it is my way of like, just like unwinding almost, which is like, I'm going to, I'm going to add more to the map. Fictitious cartography. Fictitious yeah. cartography. Gotcha. Uh, for me, it's I think the sociopolitics is what I really geek out about, and that touches lots of other 
things. It touches government, it touches history. But I like thinking about the webs of people and where their lives intersect and how that then is in conversation with the systems of power. Who has it? How do they get it? How do they keep it? Who wants it? How are they trying to get it? Who's preventing them from getting it? Like those webs are what are so interesting to me. And it's how I end up with like my sprawling character maps of these people know these people and three generations back, they did this. And uh, family trees are also another thing. <laughs> I probably just like, no one needs to know any of this, but I'm going to make it. I think similarly the idea of webs and how things connect, because for me, it's textiles and food. Because if I can write a dinner party and know exactly what they're eating and why they're eating it and what everyone's wearing to show up, I know everything I need to know about this world. I know the geography. I know the climate that can grow these foods or the trade routes that are bringing those foods to these people. I know the cultural background that has significance to these foods or why they're new and different and they're trying something that's all, you know, the fad now to eat this particular spice because it's just coming in. I know also from the textiles, you know, what, what can be grown here, what can be raised here, what kind of trade trade routes do we have? What sort of dyes do we have is going to start to talk about the technological level of the society? Do we have mechanized looms? Do we have chemical dyes? Do we have all of this stuff? Or is it still all um, much more sort of like primitive ideas of, of dyeing and all this kind of stuff? If I know what someone's showing up to a dinner party wearing and what they're going to have to eat, I, I've figured out everything else. <laughs> You, you all realize you literally just did without practice uh, people, places, and things, right? <laughs> <laughs> like one at a time. <laughs> that just kind of happened. Um, so we just have a couple more questions. But first, I wanted to give you all an opportunity to um, tell our listeners about your own work. You're all writers. Um, what should people look out for from you all? Oh, God, I have to start. Okay. Um, I write the Oven Cycle, which is historical fantasy set in an alternate ancient Rome. I gave the ancient Romans magic to see what they would do with it, and it was wonderful and terrible things. Uh, the first two books are From Unseen Fire and Give Way Tonight. They are out now. And the third book, The Bloodstained Shade, is I am hoping going to be out in January. Oh, thanks, Marshall. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I am also a writer and write the uh, wrote the Unraveled Kingdom trilogy, which is Torn, Frey, and Rule. That starts with a seamstress who can ply magic into her sewing, um, trying very desperately to avoid outright revolution in her city. And spoiler alert, it doesn't work. Um, so that is what I have out already from Orbit Books and out from Orbit in March or April. I should find out which one of those it is at some point. Um, is the Fairy Bargains of Prospect. Prospect Hill, which is a historical um, fantasy imagining what if you could actually bargain with fairies and um, kind of in set in rural Midwestern Gilded Age um, family orchard early suffragette stuff. Anyway, yeah, cool. so all kinds of stuff happening there. And deep breath. And. My main writing is I've written the Meridane Saga, which is four fantasy trilogies that all intertwine, starting with The Thorn of Denton Hill, A Murder of Mages, The Holver Alley Crew, and Way of the Shield, and then continuing on with The Alchemy of Chaos, An Import of Intrigue, Lady Hanterman's Wardrobe, Shield of the People, uh, The Impostors of Aventil, A Parliament of Bodies, The Fenmere Job, and finally People of the City. And then after that, I have... Two, one standalone diesel punk fantasy that is completely different from everything else, which is The Velocity of Revolution, which is about motorcycles and train heists and magic psychic mushrooms and tacos. And, and yes. Um, and then also a standalone set in the Meridane world, which is an unintended voyage in which one of my characters from Meridane ends up stuck on a ship to the other side of the world and then has to navigate her way around a strange city where she has no money, doesn't speak the language, doesn't understand the culture, and has an enormous debt to pay off. Very cool. It's a, uh, very prolific, yes. all of you, <laughs> as well as the podcast. He brings our whole average up. <laughs> all right, so one more question. Um, this one's hard to answer. What was your favorite vote to cast for this year's Hugo? What was the one that made you most excited to hit one? Uh, it's, it's easy for me. Um, uh, Fonda Lee for, for uh, the Greenbone Saga for best series. I, I have loved that. I got to read the first one a little bit early. It made me cry on a plane, or uh, the third one rather. I got to read early, made me cry on a plane. So I'm just so happy that that was nominated and I was really, really happy to get to press that button. <laughs> Hard same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard same, is that what you said? Yeah, it is so good. And I, I just adored that series so much. And 
With the caveat that there was so much good stuff on the ballot this year. Um, Oh my gosh, just like reading that voter packet was a treat and also overwhelming. Um, Yeah, I would have to say my fingers are crossed for Fonda, friend of the podcast and delightful human being. (laughs) And our fingers are crossed for you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming and uh, we'll see uh, see you tomorrow. Good luck. Thank you.